we actually found some very fascinating evidence for both uh, domestic and ritual occupation. For example, on the west or on the southern end of the trench, we found a series of complete uh, jars and vases, including Chongek, uh, which indicates to us that this was a site that was heavily occupied, either contemporary with the Previ here or beforehand, which means that this was built on a site of significance. So uh, my name is Andrew Harris, and I'm the director of the Angkor Vihar project, which is a collaboration between uh, APSAR National Authority and the Archaeology Centre of the University of Toronto. So we started with excavating uh, seven trenches at this site. The sizes ranged between 10 by 2 meters to as small as 1.5 by 0 0.5 meters. Okay. And based on our survey last year, as well as survey work that was conducted uh, in the first year of the MOU, we wanted to understand a little bit more about this building. It's a Previhir or Vihara. And the interesting thing about it is that there are two, if not more, building phases. And the first thing that we noticed was that there was a juncture or break between this structure here, which is a cruciform or cross-shaped structure, and the one to the east, which is a lateral or rectangular structure. So our goals of this field season were to understand the cruciform structure, understand how these two structures connected or were built over, figure out a little bit more about this structure to the left, which is called a pretier or a reliquary, and understand how t types of practices surrounding that would have been related to the Previ here in general. And we also wanted to understand a little bit more about occupation activities surrounding the Previ here, how people lived, how people uh, understood their religious sites, and also, to a lesser extent, the relationship between the Previ here and the infrastructure to the north. We did not excavate into the pond, but there is a large pond uh, directly to the north of us. So, well, so I can think of the, the first, the cruciform structure. We found a large roof, not just roof tiles, but an entire roof that was approximately, uh, I think it was 90 bags worth of ceramics of roof tiles. And that helps us understand a little bit more about what was on top of the cruciform. Within there as well, we found a series of five blocks, which were or what, what we believed were originally the old uh, pedestal for the Buddha or Balang, which we believed was moved to the new terrace or rectangular structure. Upon further excavation, we unearthed two very important Chinese vessels. And what we understood from those is that those may have been burials or may have been an interment within those blocks. But it li it's likely that was no longer, we no longer believe that was the original uh, Balang. Well, another, another important trench we excavated is to the west and we wanted to understand more about what types of occupation were surrounding the Previ here. And the mo we, we actually found some very fascinating evidence for both uh, domestic and ritual occupation. For example, on the west or on the southern end of the trench, we found a series of complete uh, jars and vases, including Chongek, uh, which indicates to us that this was a site that was heavily occupied either contemporary with the Previ here or beforehand, which means that this was built on a site of significance. On the northern side, we also found the remains of a spillover from the pond to the north. And what we're thinking is that this pond may have been purposely or naturally overflowed due to monsoons that occurred during the 13th to 15th centuries. Within that, within that fill, we found a number of artifacts that give us a sense that there was domestic occupation directly north of the Previ here, but we are not quite sure yet. Again, we have to look at the artifacts uh, and analyze those before we can make any conclusions. Another site over to the northeast this year, did an excavation there, mm -hmm. and it worked out really well because we finished up some work from last year and then we're able to do a focus on this. So I think, I think the, the project has progressed rapidly and efficiently. We've gone from excavating test trenches and clearing sites across all of Angkor Thom to a more focused study at a site that is obviously very significant given the amount of infrastructure surrounding it as well as its proximity to the Bayon Temple. What we're learning here is just, it compounds what we have 
learned in previous seasons, even when we focused on larger scale excavations, and especially in 2022. So I would say that the project has matured. I would say that it has become a lot more grounded in its aims, and it's a great way to potentially move forward into the future with another collaboration with Absol Authority. The goal of the research has been to understand the process of religious transition and also understand that despite that what history has written mostly by foreigners, that religious transition as a process is not cut and dry. There are religions that are often interspersed with one another. The influences of one type of architecture may come to a previ here, for example. You have here a cruciform structure, which oftentimes is resembling the base of a prasad or a temple. How did these structures gain from the past in order to manifest into the future? As well, we're interested in understanding a little bit more when this happened. For a long time, it was thought that Previ here were a product of the post Angkorian period and middle period, where they were alongside the restorations to Angkor Wat, products of later monarchs from Longvek, Sri Santor, and Udong. Here, through a number of papers we've published, we've learned actually that, Buddha, that Theravada Buddhism and the construction of Previ here as religious sanctuaries occurred concurrently or at the same time as many final inscriptions to temples as well as uh, the restoration and recycling of stone into the conversion of temples. So all of these monuments were being used at the same time and the idea that there is a Hindu phase, Mahayana Buddhist phase, Theravada Buddhist phase is not only incorrect but it does not necessarily give credit to the Angkorian civilization and its consistencies over time. The idea that in the late 13th century, temples suddenly stopped being built or inscriptions suddenly stopped being written completely discredits what came afterwards. Whereas we see here, and through carbon dating and looking at Chinese ceramics and looking at import wares, we will probably, in, will probably indicate that this in fact was active when the Bayon was still a religious monument as a pantheon rather than something in memory. You will have a better idea on where this religious transition goes and where what we can essentially interpret from these last centuries. It's a lot it's a lot to say but there's an important the important point is here that there is no epoch or no phase of religion. There is simply the continuation of culture and civilization and the Angkorian culture and civilization did not and despite all of the site many interpretations did not suddenly cease to be after the death of Jayavarma the seventh. So within our surveys we have identified so far 72 and this number could be understated, Previ here, Buddhist terraces, whatnot, within Angkor Thom. Approximately 60 some of these are surrounded by Sima, which is how we understand what they would be. Others we've actually found through clearance that there are sockets for Sima, which means that they've been taken away. In terms of the idea that all of them would have been abandoned, we have historical evidence that there was in fact some occupation of Angkor Thom in the 16th century corresponding with Angkor Wat. We also have evidence of renovations to these structures during the, or we actually don't quite know when those would be, but they include the reintroduction of fired brick. We actually have found a number of monuments with brick built over top of sandstone and laterite. We have uh, what are known as southern lateral aisles, which are raised platforms for the monks that were introduced in a later period that would have been uh, placed in recycled stone, often vertically stacked from from monuments that may no longer exist or have been dismantled. But in terms of when was abandoned, when were sites abandoned and were they abandoned together, I would say absolutely not. We have evidence, for example, at this site here of blue and white Chinese wares. And that is an important, without carbon dates from this yet, an important uh, aspect of how we will seriate, which essentially means understand when they were occupied over time. Uh, because Chinese Ming Dynasty or blue and white wares were only imported after a certain period. And we know this from connections uh, and research projects that have gone on within China and within Thailand, within Vietnam, within Cambodia, that this marks a different period. 
in excavations, especially those that are going on right now in Sre Santor, they will find a number of these blue and white wares because this is what was imp exported when or imported to Cambodia at the time in which this uh, in this these kingdoms existed. If we find them here, it's evidence of later occupation. We have found a number of blue and white wares here. At other sites that we've excavated, we haven't found any. So there is potential that we may talk about abandonment. We may talk about abandonment at the same time. And in fact, there may have been times where these sites were not used. But clearly, especially from these excavations, we know that the sites were being reoccupied. Or they were never abandoned. And both of those are avenues for research that we hope to continue to look at more uh, in future seasons. And I'll add to that just quickly. Uh, there were accounts by Europeans in the 17th century that Angkor Thom was fully abandoned at some point. Within the 19th century, uh, when it was first, when the, the site was first cleared, it was evidently had been deserted for a long time. But with the cleared monuments you see around the Bayan, for example, or Tepranam, that's more the work of populations that moved in afterwards, as well as the original uh, French clearers of the monuments. These structures were cataloged as what are known in French as monuments secondaires, or secondary monuments. They were seen as unimportant compared to the temples. Even the structure as large as this was not necessarily seen worthy of clearance. And it was left deserted and left to the jungle. And this is, it's surprising that our excavation represents the first focused ex, uh, archaeological in, investigation of this monument. There were clearances before, Apsar Authority actually uh, cleared this monument in the early 2000s, but not within the history of archaeology at Angkor has this been excavated. So it's been very exciting. A structure like this remains uninvestigated. Yeah, like, yeah, I'm playing a little bit. Lots of old man types.